Okay, um, everyone, thank you for attending our first afternoon session today. And our first speaker is Dr. Gwendolyn Thalaco from MIT, uh, formerly of LACMA, and she has her PhD from Harvard University. So uh, without further ado, uh, Gwendolyn, why don't you take it away? All right, well, thank you so much. And um, as Devin mentioned, uh, my name is Gwendolyn Colasso, and I am the collections curator of the Aga Khan Documentation Center here at MIT. And uh, today I'll be talking about some mobile images and malleable market practices for Ottoman costume albums. So in the mid 17th century, the famous Ottoman traveler, Evliya Chelebi, estimated that over a thousand painters operated in well over a hundred shops in Istanbul. Though Evliya has been known to inflate his numbers, the crux of his observations remains quite astute. He sets the stage for a vibrant art scene in Istanbul, teeming with active painters. And perhaps the most successful and longest running genre of manuscript painting to emerge from this diverse market was the costume album. Now, this form of compilation enjoyed immense popularity among European travelers during its entire period of production, from off for the, roughly the late 16th century to the mid 19th century, also gaining favor among Ottoman consumers in its later years. And from its inception, the genre grew in close conversation with early modern travel illustrations that assiduously cataloged Ottoman society into intricate cultural taxonomies. Costume, as the most visible markers of status and identity, garnered the intense scrutiny of travelers and armchair enthusiasts alike, who systematically documented forms of dress into printed and painted costume books sold across Europe. But by the last quarter of the 16th century, new players entered this arena. Ottoman artists, possibly in response to travelers' requests, saw the business opportunity at hand and they began crafting their own works to fulfill this growing appetite for images of Ottoman dress. Their paintings appeared to echo the decontextualized compositions of their European counterparts, while drawing some stylistic elements from Ottoman single folio painting and their premier form of collection, albums, which were already in use at the Ottoman court. Now, after some early experimentation, costume album production took off in earnest in the 1610s, where one identifiable workshop began churning out character studies in opaque watercolor, which allowed viewers to appreciate the particulars of each character's costume, be it a sultan or his subjects from the palace to the city streets. And unlike European costume books, the viewers encountered these details straight from Ottoman hands. As for scholarship on costume albums, this has largely occurred in two main fronts. The first and earlier of this research included broad, though insightful, short essays that thematically contextualized the genre as a whole. On the other front are tightly focused case studies introducing the enumerated contents of individual costume albums. And as these case studies continue to be an active, if not crucial, area of research, Questions still abound regarding the overt relationships between these albums, as well as the production processes behind them. And the most distinct challenge posed by these collections originates from their stock models, which Ottoman artists intensively replicated and recreated in slight variations across many albums in their long history of production. Numerous scholars have suggested the use of pounces or pin pricked stencils as the transfer method that replicated models so closely that their form outlines often match down to the millimeter in codices compiled near the same time. And this production approach gave 17th century costume albums a recognizable aesthetic, perhaps even a trademark look, which also made this genre the most identifiable form of Ottoman commercial painting. Yet, as simple as their individual images may appear on the page, they cast a far more complex web when considering how this shared model corpus generated endless combinations of related figures. Yet, I would argue that part of their appeal to owners was the delight in taking home a unique matrix of characters tailored to their particular interests. And that brings me to the focus of my talk today, which analyzes the visual data of costume albums from the 17th century 
to construct a nuanced history that traces how the commercial production of costume paintings responded to changing collecting trends among consumers on Istanbul's market. I offer one digital approach that systematically delves into these profuse repetitions in models to yield crucial data on the changing image corpus. I then bring this data to bear upon the construction of these collections as books whose complex material realities have remained notably absent from the study of the genre. And I want to note that today I'm only focusing on the 17th century costume albums because this pivotal group represents or it, it encompasses the beginning of large-scale production of the genre. And it also captures a boom, if not the height of this early workshop's output. It's also a period that has seldom been understood as a time of intense transformation for this genre. Roughly 20 costume albums survive from this century, with several others we only know of from auction lots or excise folios. And it's a relatively contained group due to several gaps in production. One hiatus is 40 years prior to the start of this group, with another beginning near the start of the 18th century and ending around 1770, when this genre was completely reborn um, with a new style, new materials, and differing production methods that um, may reflect a completely different painter work, painterly workshop. To return to those 17th century costume albums, what I've described regarding their appeal of their figures stems from these two quotes by the travelers Peter Mundi and Pietro della Valle, largely regarded as the only two textual sources on costume albums, yet both offer precious little detail in terms of production. So we won't be digging into these quotes very closely, but I will just point out that one important detail from Della Valle is that he mentioned he commissioned this project. However, it turns out those two quotes are not the only two sources on costume albums, since it turns out that Della Valle discusses this album again, if we return to the original Italian text, um, which is often abridged in English translations. It turns out that almost eight months after his first letter, he writes one more that states, Quote, it would have been necessary here, if I am not mistaken, to describe also to your lordship all the different clothes of these people, the differences of which are known to each other, and a thousand other similar curiosities. However, a book ought to be made, as a letter is not enough, and yet I leave it here and hold myself to bring the book back upon my return, which I am already putting together, namely one of figures in all costumes depicted as best as possible in Turkey. And I already have more than 50 different ones, and I will have more. I will collate or gather them into a book. And then if I have enough patience, I will add four verses in my hand to each figure as a statement. So this letter grants us a far deeper view into an album as a compilation. And we can consider this collection of over 50 different paintings, likely loose leaf paintings, um, given de la Valle's intention of receiving more. And likewise, he's surprisingly explicit in his involvement in this album's production, claiming that he would be the one to collate the paintings and annotate them himself in verses no less. But he makes no mention of whether he enlisted the aid of Ottoman artisans to assist in the labor of this compilation, as we know some of his contemporaries did. Yet even if Della Valle did the same, his ownership of the vision for this project is clear. Now, the, whereabout, the whereabouts of Della Valle's album remain unknown, but several contemporaneous collections also reveal heavy patron involvement in the compilation process. This album in Venice is among the few from the early 17th century that still sports a binding dating to its period of creation. And surprisingly, it's an Italian binding, not an, Ottoman, not an Ottoman binding, which was likely created upon its owner's return home. Such, such limp vellum bindings were among the cheapest type of binding money could buy during this time. And if we turn to the paintings, they are unevenly pasted across the folios, suggesting the work of an amateur paper joiner rather than the work of an Ottoman professional. Perhaps like Della Valle, this owner received a set of paintings and tried his hand at collating them in the best binding he could afford. In this case, and in Della Valle's anecdote about his expanding collection, 
together, in my mind, best capture the concept of the costume album as part of a malleable set in scope and form. In essence, these albums were novelties crafted from commonplace figures. Their repeated decontextualized paintings did not inherently possess a fixed context or a single schema that governed their placement. And these works relied upon the consumer, either with help or not, to methodically arrange them into meaningful complexes. The novel and unexpected connections they forged brought forth bespoke portraits of Ottoman society. And so how does all, all of this uh, connect to wider collecting trends? To uncover all of this, I created a visualization that compared all the known models in 17th century costume albums to find out just how far those relationships between album contents extended. The results appear in the form of a network graph typically employed in social network analyses to track commonalities between individuals, like their decision-making. And in this regard, my colleagues, Robin Dora Radway and Yal Rice have really led the way in using such digital tools to examine manuscript inscriptions found in friendship albums and Mughal codices respectively. Here, however, I'm applying these methods to visual data or the models chosen for an album. And costume albums lend themselves surprisingly well to these types of network analyses due to the consistent image transfer methods I mentioned earlier. Each album's contents were examined alongside each of its counterparts, and the common models between each pair were noted to create the data set you see below, which I ran through Google Fusion tables and later flourished to create this visualization. And so the map in front of us highlights the albums with the most weight in the entire corpus. That is the albums um, which contain the largest number of shared figural models used across the 17th century. And interestingly, those albums, namely in Bologna, Manchester, and Berlin, are not only substantial in their range of figural models, they also have actually received less scholarly attention than some of their more common counterparts. And to unpack the relationships between individual pairs, to briefly exit here, I've made a malleable version of this same data set, which allows us to pull out different types of relationships and highlight uh, different groupings to show which, which albums are most closely related. And we can then compare that data to the individual names of the models that are listed um, in, in the inscriptions for each manuscript in my data set. And go back to view. So with this information, we can begin to determine changes in the frequency of, or the popularity of particular models and how the taste of collectors changed over the course of the century. The results end up complicating several generalizations about the typical organization and appearance of these albums. For example, that they were generally created as books representing a consistent hierarchy of Ottoman society, starting with the Sultan, then his high officials, um, and then moving on to Janissaries, etc. But when we systematically compare the organization of extant albums, that statement simply does not hold true. Though some costume albums did capture that body of figures, just as many do not. In fact, it broke down pretty evenly. Of the albums I covered, 10 began with a sultan or a sultanic series, whereas another 10 had an entirely different figure, often completely unassociated with the royal retinue or court. Five don't even contain a sultanic portrait. In fact, the regular inclusion of a strict hierarchy from the sultan downwards better characterizes the organization of costume albums from the 18th century onwards, rather than most 17th century albums in their current state. From this, we can also gather that no two costume albums hold the same contents in terms of their combination of figures or their ordination. In fact, the highest percentage of overlap in models that I've encountered between two albums is 78%, and that was an unusually high outlier in my data set. That percentage alone offers just a glimmer of how drastically customizable these collections of stock characters could be. A costume album could hold as few as three paintings or as many as 315, not counting other works on paper they may hold. Moreover, not a single album examined covers the entire corpus of available models at any given time. 
And by my estimates, at its height during the mid-17th century, this image corpus contained between 350 to 400 models, which could yield innumerable combinations. And while some groupings were common, like sultans, palace servants, military figures, laborers, and women, most albums dip into one to three of these sections of society very selectively rather than comprehensively. So these are hardly encyclopedic in coverage. And this variety of contents and ordination points to highly curated selections of Ottoman society that were tailored to represent a personalized encounter uh, with the Ottoman Empire. Thus, there was no defining set of models that made a costume album complete in the eyes of their owners. Some, like this Oxford album, only include a small sampling of what we might consider the greatest hits among Ottoman laborers and military figures, whereas others, like this two-volume set at the BNF, sought to craft a more atypical spread of figures in their sections devoted to uh, women, dervish orders, and some uh, unique social encounters. Therefore, we can surmise that the consumers exercised immense individual discretion when choosing album contents and interpreting them through labels, either via an Ottoman intermediary or a European hand. What proves more vexing, however, is that the labels in all languages have proven to be very inconsistent, even when identifying the exact same models, which warrants extra caution when using or consulting album contents based on inscription lists as they've often been published. And here we have two pairings from two different albums uh, at the top and bottom. So on the top, we see that from these two albums, these figures are both listed as Cheshni gear or taste testers. And these two figures on the bottom from the two different albums are both labeled as mutaferikas. However, the costumes of both do not match. In fact, we see that the, the Pasha's taste tester and the mutaferika from another album um, actually match perfectly. And so this is why tracking this type of visual data is crucial because the models more often than their text reveal which designs remained in demand over the course of the 17th century while highlighting these types of issues of interpretations. Some models uh, like this Avja figure, the hunter, and the Rumeli Sapahisi or the cavalry men of Rumelia have a long period of use that covers almost the entirety of the century. Whereas others like the Gelim Kadin on the right, the bride and her trousseau, among her other counterparts, do not emerge until the mid 17th century, but enjoyed a considerable era of popularity in that much briefer time span. Other models fell from favor entirely by the 1640s and disappeared from the corpus. And it is this same time that the model corpus underwent a major expansion and redesign in terms of contents and stylistic approach. Changes included updates to costume elements and bodily proportions, in addition to the insertion of architectural features for select character studies. Even those iconic sultanic portraits underwent an overhaul, while the earliest costume albums, like the one on the right, followed used to oops, used to closely follow the example of the courtly Shemail Name or the Book of Physiognomy uh, from the Royal Workshop. Later on, the redesigned portraits simplified that formula, rendering bodies on a noticeably smaller scale on a larger page. Gone too are those distinctive borsa arches framing each figure. Additionally, commercial artists experimented with new kinds of sultanic portraits, wherein a single model was not necessarily tied to the identity of one sultan, as royal manuscripts often did. Instead, artists made minor alterations to the model's facial hair and headdress in order to indicate various rulers through the same model. And while this approach may have facilitated production, the change also reflected historical circumstances as well. The overall timing of this corpus redesign during the 1640s is especially significant. During this mid 17th century period, the empire endured numerous internal struggles that quickly jettisoned sultans from power in short succession. And so these changes to uh, newer models may have reflected that. More importantly, this time 
this time period not only coincides with the greatest volume of costume album production, it also coincides with the Ottoman court's departure to Edirne, roughly 1648 to 95. And after the court moves to Edirne, we see that costume albums made for Europeans in Istanbul begin to drastically diverge from those made for their elite Ottoman counterparts. Now, generally speaking, Ottomans by this time did not purchase full costume books, but it was not unusual to see some shared models in albums made for Ottomans, like the image on the right, and also in anthologies that were made for Ottoman consumers. These are almost one-to-one transfers of costume album figures. Now, this type of dynamic drastically changes in the second half of the 17th century, so that even on the odd occasion when a royal artist has borrowed commercial models for their own costume album, he had to translate that design into a distinctly courtly aesthetic, apparent from details of execution, added costume and background elements, in addition to sumptuous materials that were seldom used in the commercial color palette like lapis lazuli. And after the 1640s, as if refocusing their attentions on the remaining European consumers in Istanbul, commercial artists retailored their offerings, expanding the diversity of figures in terms of cultural origin, age, and occupation. In this costume album in Florence, we find that the non-Ottoman figures actually ended up outnumbering the inhabitants of the Ottoman Empire, which were the initial focus of this whole genre. Instead, we have more figures from Central Asia and also the Mughal Empire. And on top of that, these new models appear to draw directly upon Mughal and Safavid paintings, meaning that commercial artists tapped into a widening range of imported artwork on the market, which European travelers were simultaneously collecting, sometimes in the same albums as their costume album figures. Moreover, the mid 17th century becomes a prime moment when special commissions broke the established norms in terms of format, with examples like this stunning nine meter costume scroll, which features an anonymous sultanic portrait made for a Dutch patron. And this scroll was likely based off of European antecedents uh, that were brought to Ottoman artists, such as um, the printed processional scroll above or its watercolor counterparts. During the same time, the same time of experimentation, we also see incredible scenic complexity found within albums like the famous Tashner and Chikonya codices, which were once part of the same compilation commissioned during the 1660s. And this was for the Venetian bylo Saronzo. And at least in the Chikonya codex, we have uh, numerous images that reflect his uh, affairs and interests in Constantinople during the Ottoman and Venetian war in Crete. But when we look at its counterpart of the Tashner album, we have scenes from Ottoman daily life in the palace and the city. And both these albums have garnered well-deserved attention for these rare scenes. However, when we map their models in relation to the wider image corpus, some of the unique qualities of these striking scenes in actuality had far wider appeal. Almost every single figure you see in the city scenes from these two codices also appear as single figure studies in anonymous albums in Bologna and Parma. Both contain figures of unusually small proportions as if scaled to fit a scene. And while a normal sized figure in a costume album is about 10 to 12 centimeters, these albums contain figures and models that are approximately a third to a half that size. So what did mapping these figures reveal to us about those surviving scenes? Well, if we take the example of a mosque scene from the Tashner album, we see a circular narrative with the stages of prayer through six characters, beginning with that young man performing ablutions on the bottom right. In the Bologna album, the same characters inhabit separate folios that were grouped together to create a flipbook effect, albeit with the ablutions incorrectly placed at the end. And these works indicate that artists were envisioning each scene as a composite of models, individual models that were later connected by larger architectural features that could have been free drawn. Other scenes from the Tashner album mix figures of various scales and proportions, often for narrative effect. 
For example, here we have a circumcision scene playing out at the bottom with musicians, the surgeon and his assistants performing the circumcision. And above, we have the young man who is enlarged and shown after, <laughs> afterwards in the recovery stage to this surgery. The rather formulaic construction of commissioned scenes reveals that these artists rarely created a work it totally from scratch. The intervisual relationship across albums reveals how these artists capitalized on a design to gain as much economic traction out of an individual model as possible, so number of sales. No creative effort went wasted on just a single project. If the artists had to create a new design for a new figure for a special commission, it was then recirculated as a welcome addition to an ever diversifying stock. The individual pieces of a scene thus became products that held just as much appeal as standalone character studies. What is more striking, however, is that the sheer number of small and medium scaled figures found in other albums dwarfs the limited number of surviving scenes wherein we can place them. This abundance of miniature figures suggests that these scenes may only represent a small fraction of a much wider phenomenon in this market. So while network graphs and models present a rather clean portrait of the image corpus, the codicology of costume albums captures a rather messy material reality as none have survived the centuries unaltered. After all, the vast majority of costume albums from the 17th century actually have European bindings that date to at least a century or more after the collection's creation. Additionally, the methods of compiling these paintings remained far from standardized, even among the earliest cases. Some, like that Venetian album we began with, uses entirely European mounts and bindings to hold its European paintings, whereas its contemporaneous counterparts actually have Ottoman inscriptions and Ottoman decoupages applied directly onto the supporting pages, which suggests that these paintings were at least mounted in Istanbul. As for collation techniques, only in a few cases do we actually have uh, figures painted directly onto bifolia sheets, which were folded into regular choirs for binding, as we see here. And all these cases are post 1640s. Far more often, we have single folios that were attached to makeshift choirs through some very creative means. In one method, this resulted in visible stubs that appear regularly between each folio of an album. And these appear to be formed from loose leaves that were folded over to create a workable spine. And that process was repeated to construct a choir that could be sewn into the book. In other cases, loose leaves were pasted onto a base of stubs, as we see in the Ralam album. And this very famous album is one that deserves uh, this type of material examination because it's so often been published as individual plates, like the image here. However, this visual is really quite deceiving since if we consider the full opening, it reveals that this work has been rearranged and entirely reorganized within a 19th century notebook. So the collection as it's been published is not in its original form. And several others, um, other albums were completely remounted onto modern cardstock. Most importantly, the majority of costume albums that still exist today bear these types of intensive alterations to their contents, like excised pages or complete reorganizations. Later owners could produce entirely new compilations from an older album, and that was the case with the Tashner and Chagonia codices, but they were hardly alone. This album at the Bodleian preserves an older foliation that demonstrates these paintings formerly belonged to a collection that once held over a hundred paintings, a far cry from its current state with just 11 figures. And from these circumstances, we can easily ascertain how so many loose folios from Ottoman costume albums ended up re-entering the market to be sold at auction. Yet among costume albums, much of this excised content seldom constituted a couple random pages, but these were adjustments of the entire scope of the compilation. Many alterations seem to make discerning choices regarding the album as a collection or an open-ended project 
the form of which remained prone to expansion, reduction, and improvement in the eyes of owners, even at times for profit. Thus, in some ways, it may be more appropriate to think of costume albums not as finished products at their time of creation, but as an early modern format that existed in a constant state of becoming from the start. And this dynamic is most striking in one of only two costume albums I found that survive with its original Ottoman binding. And this work preserves traces of a complete reconceptualization of the collection contents shortly after its creation. And that occurred due to some, some type of visible water accident, which we see the traces of along the edges of these um, folios. But what it also left behind are older Ottoman foliations, which we can compare to the current ordination of the book. And it differs quite a bit. New paintings were inserted um, that were added within the same decade after the water damage repair. And we can see that this album transformed from being a collection of primarily courtly figures to one that was expanded to have a much more multidimensional view of Ottoman popular culture and society. Such physical interventions across the codex reveal that each costume album constituted an intellectual conversation held over years or even centuries of ownership. This, con this conceptual basis of these works as an open-ended matrix, really the heart of album making, impacted every material aspect from their changing body of images to the construction of their codices. And the purposeful flexibility of their models offered boundless opportunities for artists to resituate their designs in man into manifold contexts and formats and for owners to re-envision um, their context as well. Yet even in the continued transformation of its models and the albums that held them, the genre of costume albums embodies how consumer choice could sculpt the history of the commodified image on a readily expanding market. Thank you.